So what's next? Implementation. Um, just a few last really quick notes and then we can have sort of one last pause for questions. Um, again, as we mentioned, this was adopted by 28 federal awarding agencies on, it was published in the Federal Register on December 19, 2014. So you can see that it was, a, it was what we call a common interim final rule. One document, but really 28 different rules. Um, and the agencies implemented that guidance. Again, that one key sentence, X department adopts the language of 2 CFR 200. A few exceptions and additions. A lot of cleaning out, you'll see chapters, entire chapters in the CFR removed and reserved where agencies are cleaning out old regs. And a lot of updating existing regs. So regs that haven't changed, but their references now cite uniform guidance. Um, those regulations, all available in Title II of the CFR, so if you go there, Title II, you'll see OMB uniform guidance and then each of the agency regs. And then it's effective for awards issued on or after December 26th. So it's in effect, we're live, uniform guidance is on, it's now, get excited. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how to do it. Um, the joint interim final rule, there were public, it was a public comment period, it closed February 17th. Um, again, the uniform guidance itself is final, it's been final since last December, but the implementing rule is an interim final rule. Again, no new material there. It's either the uniform guidance or existing policy, but we did accept public comments. And OMB is in the process of reviewing those comments now with the COFAR and federal awarding agencies. Um, the metrics. OMB Memorandum M1417 establishes the metrics. Again, we're not just assuming success here, but we actually want to measure whether we effectively reduced administrative burden and risk of waste, fraud, and abuse. So there are metrics that we've collected already from agencies and it's now open on the COFAR website. You'll see that website on the next slide, but it's cfo.gov slash COFAR. And we really want to hear from all of you. Are we on the path? This, this is our baseline metrics year because we haven't fully implemented yet, but what are the reforms that look like they have the most potential to reduce administrative burden, reduce risk of waste, fraud, and abuse, or conversely, increase administrative burden, increase risk of waste, fraud, and abuse. And most importantly, we want to hear from stakeholders. Did you feel engaged in the process? Do you have the opportunity to engage with the COFAR when you need to? If you provided feedback, even if it didn't 100% get adopted, did it appear responsive? So we want to make sure that we're conducting the open process that we hope we are as well. Um, and that portal is currently open on the COFAR website. Just to warn you, it's a very rudimentary portal there. It's basically a one question survey. Unfortunately, due to our own rules, if we were to do anything more robust, it would be an official OMB information collection and it would have to go through the entire process just like any other form and would become a very administratively burdensome uh, <laughs> process to collect information about whether or not we've reduced administrative burden. So we didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I know. We're, so we have this portal and it just says, please look at the memo M1417 and then tell us whatever you want to tell us. So it's up to you to read that memo and see what we're hoping for. But any feedback that you'd like to provide is very much welcome. Um, and we hope that you'll help us out there. And this is the COFAR website where we have a number of resources, webcasts, frequently asked questions, crosswalks for the old guidance and the new guidance. Um, information that kind of guides you through the agency implementation and the exceptions there. Um, so please visit that website. It will be very helpful to you in understanding the uniform guidance. And thank you. That was that was a, a recommendation there for the. Uh, okay, great. You heard a plug for the crosswalk. Yeah. Uh, for the feedback, you know, for the University of California, uh, we uh, recommend to consider, you know, raise the uh, micro purchase threshold from K to 5K because our property, our procurement cost is a lot of universities. So, what is the likelihood that uh, OFD will change and remove that threshold up? Yeah. Already raise up that threshold. 
Okay, good question. So the question is about the micro purchase threshold. And particularly it's 3,000 and the University of California has a purchase card threshold of 5,000. We've gotten this question from universities quite a bit. Um, and I think, you know, it's unfortunate that the COFAR in creating this policy really did not think about purchase cards at all. So as far as the COFAR is concerned, you could make your purchase card threshold at any level. Um, and it was not necessarily intended to be the micro purchase threshold is the purchase card threshold. Those were two different things that the COFAR really didn't look at. Um, we know for the university community, it's resonating that way. So it's something we're taking a look at. The micro purchase threshold itself, it was not a number that the COFAR picked because they like that number per se. It's taken from the federal acquisition threshold as a threshold that matches and the FAR threshold changes from time to time. Um, the simplified acquisition purchase threshold also changes from time to time. Um, but the COFAR didn't debate those levels specifically. It was more just wanting to set that uniformity across contracts and grants writ large. So the COFAR, right now the uniform guidance is set, but we are hearing that feedback from the university community. And I think it's important to mention one thing I did not mention is that there is a one year grace period for um, conforming to the procurement standards in particular for those entities where the procurement standards are new. So in that time, we're definitely having that conversation with the federal agencies about how we can resolve this conflict for universities. So I don't know what we'll say. I don't know how it'll work out, but um, it was never the COFAR's intention to put a my, to put a purchase card threshold in there really at all. No, no agencies have changed it, and it would be hard to change because the uniform guidance is, is final and it's consistent with the FAR. What I would say is that, you know, if you look at the guidance at each of those thresholds in terms of 3,000 and 150,000, and think about what they really require, 3,000 just means you can go ahead and make a purchase, you know, try to shop around. 150,000 is you have to do a little bit of looking, but then you can go ahead and make a purchase. Again, those documentation requirements, you don't have to do a cost price analysis, you don't have to do a vendor selection. So when the COFAR was thinking about this, really 150,000 was the level that they were thinking about for that more stringent procurement process. And I think it came as a surprise to the COFAR really that the university community kind of latched onto this 3,000 level as something that aligned with the purchase card threshold. So again, I kind, of, I kind of wonder if we hadn't included the micro purchase threshold at all, if universities might have just seen that 150,000 threshold and been fine. Um, and the COFAR really was trying to even provide more flexibility at the 3,000 level. So I can see that there's a challenge there and you know, it's something I think the COFAR is gonna think about. Yeah. Yes, almost all agencies are working on training, technical assistance, outreach. If you go to the COFAR website, here I'll put it back up, there are a number of webcasts, crosswalks, resources there. There are also a number of non-federal organizations that are providing technical assistance and we're gonna be posting some of their resources. Just links, not necessarily only be endorsed, but tips for places to go for more guidance. Federal agencies are all working on that now, so I think a lot more outreach, technical assistance, training, all of that will be coming um, again over the course of the next year. Yep. Can I just maybe just piggyback a little bit on that in terms of procurement? I think that it, maybe it was a naming type thing, and particularly from a small purchase or whatever, but it would be below 150000 That could also include construction. Yeah. So it's not just it's really technical, the technical name there is the simplified acquisition threshold. Um, we know, we call it small purchases for short, but any kind of acquisition below $150,000 uh, falls under the threshold there. Yep. 
Okay, yeah, the FADA and the Data Act. So the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act um, required transparency for grants and contracts above $25,000. And so that was passed in 2009. And that was kind of, that's kind of the work that, the, um, that you see on USAspending.gov, again, to publish grants and contracts above that $25,000 threshold. Um, the Data Act is actually all federal spending, not limited to grants and contracts. So the federal government spends money in other ways, just in general operations, that now comes under. And that $25,000 threshold is removed, so you have all grants and contracts kind of aggregated in there. Um, there are also requirements for data standards. So data standards are, you know, it's a, it's a word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but in this context, specifically standardizing the information that we put about federal awards on those websites. And some of that has been standardized. We have, for example, definitions of the data elements posted on USA Spending, um, but that data quality has really been challenging. Again, I think because the fundamental challenge there is that this is information that actually comes from all of you. So we have to actually standardize it, not just in what we report on the website, but actually in how we use this data in day-to-day -day life. So what you're gonna see through the Data Act is, first of, first of all, just a refresh of the website, because since the Transparency Act, um, we had the Recovery Act, and you know, we mentioned that that actually did some improvements in terms of the display and the usability of the website. So you'll see some improvements to the website itself, just building on those lessons learned from the Recovery Act. And then what you'll see is an effort to issue standard data elements, standard definitions for those data elements that are required. Um, the Data Act has a list of the data elements that are required to be reported for those spending that's a little bit longer than what you see in the Transparency Act. So you'll see those standard data elements for a little bit more data and then you'll eventually see agencies implementing that over the next few years for a more complete picture of federal spending. Another difference is the, the FADA requires, well, the way it was implemented, um, transparency for awards. So that's essentially obligations when the award is made, but you don't see expenditure data when the payment is actually made. The Data Act also includes expenditure data. So you'll see the award data and then actually when the payments were made. Yeah, it does, it does supersede Favada. Yeah, that, and it's, that implementation is kind of all folded together. So it will be the evolution of transparency reporting. Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I'm not sure that I can speak to the specific situation that you're referring to. Generally speaking, the requirement is to publish federal funds that go to both grants and contracts. And um, under the Data Act, the threshold of $25,000 is eliminated. The carve-out is for individuals. We don't publish individual data for a person. Um, but that data is aggregated. So for example, um, you know, like where Health and Human Services or USDA um, you know, provide benefits that actually go to an individual person, that data is still reported, it's just aggregated up to a level that um, you, you wouldn't identify the individual person. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how that applies to the specific situation of the beneficiaries you mentioned, but it's a good question and one to definitely follow up with 
the particular federal awarding agency, I think that would be a really good question to ask. Again, it's the federal awarding agencies that are doing this reporting, so it's not a, a reporting requirement at the subrecipient level, but past entities are required to report those subawards, so it's a good, it would be a good question to ask. Huh? Yeah, you need to know what I mean. Yeah, it's a good question to ask. Good questions. Any more questions? Like, no, it's time for happy hour. <laughs> Uh, okay, so turn it over to Ryan. Yeah, well, we did have a couple questions submitted oh. online. Oh, okay, great. Most of the questions submitted online were already addressed in some way. I thought this one was a little more specific, though. Maybe we could provide clarity on. Uh, some counties have been using the, uh, the use allowance in lieu of depreciation to fund capital improvement for the OMB A87. New rules in the super circular, section 200, uh, remove the use allowance option. How will the transition take place? How long will agencies be able to continue to use their existing rate? Interesting question. Um, the, yeah, the COFAR did eliminate use allowance, so the uniform guidance talks about depreciation only. It does not make any mention of use allowance. Um, the thinking at the time was that there really weren't many people still using use allowance, that it was coming obsolete. Um, so it's interesting to hear that there are some people that are still very much using it. I would say this is an area to definitely get in touch with the federal awarding agency and the cognizant agency where appropriate, um, because this, seem, this I think is a very specific transition issue question, and I think they'll, um, they'll be willing to work with you on how to operationalize that transition. And then we just had one more that was a little bit um, how do you account for comp time in lieu of overtime, comp time when earned or taken? If when taken, it would be extremely difficult to identify the program the comp time was originally earned, and if there is a large time gap from earned to taken, the grant reporting period may be closed. You know, I don't know that the uniform guidance gets into that level of detail okay. about comp time earned and taken, um, but it's a good question. I would just sort of highlight the general principle about salaries and wages that the work must be charged accurate, the, the cost must be charged accurately to the federal award based on records that reflect the work performed. So that that provides some flexibility in terms of how you want to structure those records. Um, to make sure that ultimately what's charged to the federal award reflects the work that was performed. Yep. Um, we had a specific question regarding the FDP. FDP? Yeah. Oh, you mean the FDP pilot or the organization? Yeah. You know, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm familiar with the FTP uh, policy that you're talking about. I know FTP is a great partnership between universities and the federal government and other entities, and they pilot a lot of interesting ideas. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't speak to that particular one, but I'd be happy to follow up. There's no uh, particular agenda in the uniform guidance with respect to that particular policy that I'm aware of. they may or they may not um, and yeah that's what that means and the COFAR did look at that word pretty carefully right along with the musts and the shoulds so uh, yes that's that's the definition you suspect 
Um, I know that issue in particular is one that they looked at, and I am not 100% sure, but I think there may be a frequently asked question on that topic. So if you look at the frequently asked questions on the COFAR website, it may or may not be there. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but I would say that uh, I, know the, I know the COFAR did think about that in that particular section of the guidance. Any other questions, Ryan? Any other on your list? Uh, we may. <laughs> um, I think that's it. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. are leading a group of federal agencies that are working together to do uh, revised research terms and conditions. There's a group of agencies that came together to do collective terms and conditions for all federal research grants. And they are now in the process of updating those terms and conditions to reflect the uniform guidance. So questions of prior written approval, there's that section of 22 times where you might have prior written approval. They are gonna go ahead and address in those terms and conditions for all of those places, whether or not you need it in the case of research awards. Um, that is a larger group of agencies than just NSF and NIH that are working together on that. I believe it's almost all of the research agencies except at this stage, I don't believe it includes DOD. Um, but they should be coming out with that very soon. So you'll see it then. Right, they would essentially say in the terms and conditions, the terms and conditions, we approve X, Y, and Z, so then you have the prior written approval in the terms and conditions of the award. They waive it. They say it's not Right, right. Then right. that's okay. Then that's okay. <laughs>